Chapter 7. Advanced Composite Materials. Description of Composite Structures. Introduction. Composite materials are becoming more important in the construction of aerospace structures. Aircraft parts made from composite materials, such as fairings, spoilers, and flight controls, were developed during the 1960s for their weight savings over aluminum parts. New generation large aircraft are designed with all composite fuselage and wing structures, and the repair of these advanced composite materials requires an in-depth knowledge of composite structures, materials, and tooling. The primary advantages of composite materials are their high strength, relatively low weight, and corrosion resistance. 7-1 Laminated Structures Composite materials consist of a combination of materials that are mixed together to achieve specific structural properties. The individual materials do not dissolve or merge completely in the composite, but they act together as one. Normally, the components can be physically identified as they interface with one another. The properties of the composite material are superior to the properties of the individual materials from which it is constructed. An advanced composite material is made of a fibrous material embedded in a resin matrix, generally laminated with fibers oriented in alternating directions, to give the material strength and stiffness. Fibrous materials are not new, wood is the most common fibrous structural material known to man. Applications of composites on aircraft include fairings, flight control surfaces, landing gear doors, leading and trailing edge panels on the wing and stabilizer, interior components, floor beams and floorboards, vertical and horizontal stabilizer primary structure on large aircraft, primary wing and fuselage structure on new generation large aircraft, turbine engine fan blades, propellers, major components of a laminate, an isotropic material has uniform properties in all directions, the measured properties of an isotropic material are independent of the axis of testing. Metals such as aluminum and titanium are examples of isotropic materials. A fiber is the primary load-carrying element of the composite material. The composite material is only strong and stiff in the direction of the fibers. Unidirectional composites have predominant mechanical properties in one direction and are said to be anisotropic, having mechanical and or physical properties that vary with direction relative to natural reference axes inherent in the material. Components made from fiber reinforced composites can be designed so that the fiber orientation produces optimum mechanical properties, but they can only approach the true isotropic nature of metals, such as aluminum and titanium. A matrix supports the fibers and bonds them together in the composite material. The matrix transfers any applied loads to the fibers, keeps the fibers in their position and chosen orientation, gives the composite environmental resistance, and determines the maximum service temperature of a composite. Strength Characteristics Structural properties, such as stiffness, dimensional stability, and strength of a composite laminate, depend on the stacking sequence of the plies. The stacking sequence describes the distribution of ply orientations through the laminate thickness. As the number of plies with chosen orientations increases, more stacking sequences are possible. For example, a symmetric 8-ply laminate with 4 different ply orientations has 24 different stacking sequences. Fiber Orientation the strength and stiffness of a composite buildup depends on the orientation sequence of the plies. The practical range of strength and stiffness of carbon fiber extends from values as low as those provided by fiberglass to as high as those provided by titanium. This range of values is determined by the orientation of the plies to the applied load. Proper selection of ply orientation in advanced composite materials is necessary to provide a structurally efficient design. The part might require 0 degrees plies to react to axial loads, plus or minus 45 degrees plies to react to shear loads and 90 degrees plies to react to side loads. Because the strength design requirements are a function of the applied load direction, ply orientation and ply sequence have to be correct. It is critical during a repair to replace each damaged ply with a ply of the same material and ply orientation. The fibers in a unidirectional material run in one direction, and the strength and stiffness is only in the direction of the fiber. Reimpregnated, prepreg, tape is an example of a unidirectional ply orientation. The fibers in a bidirectional material run in two directions, typically 90 degrees apart. A plain weave fabric is an example of a bidirectional ply orientation. These ply orientations have strength in both directions but not necessarily the same strength. Figure 7-1. The plies of a quasi-isotropic layup are stacked in a 0 degrees, 45 degrees, 45 degrees, and 90 degrees sequence, or in a 0 degrees, 60 degrees, and 60 degrees sequence. Figure 7-2 These types of ply orientation simulate the properties of an isotropic material. Many aerospace composite structures are made of quasi-isotropic materials. 7-2 Bidirectional Unidirectional 0 45 Plus 45 90 90 Unequal properties equal properties Figure 7-1 Bidirectional and unidirectional material properties 0 degrees 90 degrees plus 45 degrees 45 degrees Plus 45 45 0 Figure 7-3 A warp clock 45 degrees Plus 45 degrees 90 degrees 0 degrees 0 degrees 
90 degrees. Figure 7 2. Quasi isotropic material layout. Warp clock. Warp indicates the longitudinal fibers of a fabric. The warp is the high strength direction due to the straightness of the fibers. A warp clock is used to describe direction of fibers on the diagram, spec sheet, or manufacturer's sheets. If the warp clock is not available on the fabric, the orientation is defaulted to zero as the fabric comes off the roll. Therefore, 90 degrees to zero is the width of the fabric across. Figure 7 3. Fiber forms. All product forms generally begin with spooled unidirectional raw fibers packaged as continuous strands. An individual fiber is called a filament. The word strand is also used to identify an individual glass fiber. Bundles of filaments are identified as toes, yarns, or rovings. Fiberglass yarns are twisted, while Kevlar registered yarns are not. Toes and rovings do not have any twist. Most fibers are available as dry fiber that needs to be impregnated, impreg, with a resin before use or prepreg materials, where the resin is already applied to the fiber. Roving. A roving is a single grouping of filament or fiber ends, such as 20 end or 60 end glass rovings. All filaments are in the same direction and they are not twisted. Carbon rovings are usually identified as 3K, 6K, or 12K rovings, K meaning 1000 filaments. Most applications for roving products utilize mandrels for filament winding, and then resin cure to final configuration. Unidirectional tape. Unidirectional prepreg tapes have been the standard within the aerospace industry for many years, and the fiber is typically impregnated with thermosetting resins. The most common method of manufacture is to draw collimated raw, dry, strands into the impregnation machine, where hot melted resins are combined with the strands using heat and pressure. Tape products have high strength in the fiber direction, and virtually no strength across the fibers. The fibers are held in place by the resin. Tapes have a higher strength than woven fabrics. Figure 7-4. Bidirectional fabric. Most fabric constructions offer more flexibility for layup of complex shapes than straight unidirectional tapes offer. Fabrics offer the option for resin impregnation either by solution or the hot melt process. Generally, fabrics used for structural applications use light fibers, or strands of the same weight are yielded both the warp, longitudinal, and fill, transverse, directions. For aerospace structures, tightly woven fabrics are usually the choice to save weight, minimizing resin void size, and maintaining fiber orientation during the fabrication process. 7-3 Tape fabric Filaments Individual toes Individual toes resin 0.0030 inch Figure 7-4 Tape and fabric products Woven structural fabrics are usually constructed with reinforcement toes, strands, or yarns interlocking upon themselves with over slash under placement during the weaving process. The more common fabric styles are plain or satin weaves. The plain weave construction results from each fiber alternating over and then under each intersecting strand, toe, bundle, or yarn. With the common satin weaves, such as 5 harness or 8 harness, the fiber bundles traverse both in warp and fill directions changing over slash under position less frequently. These satin weaves have less crimp and are easier to distort than a plain weave. With plain weave fabrics and most 5 or 8 harness woven fabrics, the fiber strand count is equal in both warp and fill directions. For example, 3K plain weave often has an additional designation, such as 12x12, meaning there are 12 toes per inch in each direction. This count designation can be varied to increase or decrease fabric weight, or to accommodate different fibers of varying weight. Figure 7-5. Non-woven, knitted or stitched. Knitted or stitched fabrics can offer many of the mechanical advantages of unidirectional tapes. Fiber placement can be straighter unidirectional without the over slash under turns of woven fabrics. The fibers are held in place by stitching with fine yarns or threads after pre-selected orientations of one or more layers of dry plies. These types of fabrics offer a wide range of multi-ply orientations. Although there may be some added weight penalties or loss of some ultimate reinforcement fiber properties, some gain of interlaminar shear and toughness properties may be realized. Some common stitching yarns are polyester, aramid, or thermoplastics. Figure 7-6. Types of fiber. Fiberglass. Fiberglass is often used for secondary structure on aircraft, such as fairings, radomes, and wing tips. Fiberglass is also used for helicopter rotor blades. There are several types of fiberglass used in the aviation industry. Electrical glass, or e-glass, is identified as such for electrical applications. It has high resistance to current flow. E-glass is made from borosilicate glass. S-glass and S2 glass identify structural fiberglass that have a higher strength than E-glass. S-glass is produced from magnesia alumina silicate. Advantages of fiberglass are lower cost than other composite materials, chemical or galvanic corrosion resistance, and electrical properties. Fiberglass does not conduct electricity. Fiberglass has a white color and is available as a dry fiber fabric or prepreg material. Hevler registered. Hevler registered is DuPont's name for aramid fibers. Aramid fibers are lightweight, strong, and tough. Two types of aramid fiber are used in the aviation industry. Kevlar Registered 49 has a high stiffness and Kevlar Registered 29 has a low stiffness. An advantage of aramid fibers is their high resistance to impact damage, so they are often used in areas prone to impact damage. 
The main disadvantage of aramid fibers is their general weakness in compression and hygroscopy. Service reports have indicated that some parts made from Kevlar registered absorb up to 8% of their weight in water. Therefore, parts made from aramid fibers need to be protected from the environment. Another disadvantage is that Kevlar registered is difficult to drill and cut. The fibers buzz easily, and special scissors are needed to cut a 7 4 8 harness satin weave example. Style 3K135 8H carbon. Plain weave example. Style 3K70P carbon. 4 shaft satin weave example. Style 120 fiberglass. 8 shaft satin weave example. Style 1581 fiberglass. Crowfoot satin weave example. Style 285 Kevlar registered. 5 harness satin weave example. Style 1K50-5H carbon. 8 shaft satin weave example. Style 181 fiberglass. Figure 7-5. Typical fabric weave styles. 0 degrees 90 degrees. Plus 45 degrees. 90 degrees. 45 degrees. Figure 7-6. Non-woven material, stitched. Material. Kevlar registered is often used for military ballistic and body armor applications. It has a natural yellow color and is available as dry fabric and pre-preg material. Bundles of aramid fibers are not sized by the number of fibers like carbon or fiberglass, but by the weight. Carbon slash graphite. One of the first distinctions to be made among fibers is the difference between carbon and graphite fibers, although the terms are frequently used interchangeably. Carbon and graphite fibers are based on graphene, hexagonal, layer. 7-5. Networks present in carbon. If the graphene layers, or planes, are stacked with three-dimensional order, the material is defined as graphite. Usually extended time and temperature processing is required to form this order, making graphite fibers more expensive. Bonding between planes is weak. Disorder frequently occurs such that only two-dimensional ordering within the layers is present. This material is defined as carbon. Carbon fibers are very stiff and strong, three to ten times stiffer than glass fibers. Carbon fiber is used for structural aircraft applications, such as floor beams, stabilizers, flight controls, and primary fuselage and wing structure. Advantages include its high strength and corrosion resistance. Disadvantages include lower conductivity than aluminum, therefore, a lightning protection measure coating is necessary for aircraft parts that are prone to lightning strikes. Another disadvantage of carbon fiber is its high cost. Carbon fiber is gray or black in color and is available as dry fabric and pre-preg material. Carbon fibers have a high potential for causing galvanic corrosion when used with metallic fasteners and structures. Figure 7-7. Boron. Boron fibers are very stiff and have a high tensile and compressive strength. The fibers have a relatively large diameter and do not flex well, therefore, they are available only as a pre-preg tape product. An epoxy matrix is often used with the boron fiber. Boron fibers are used to repair cracked aluminum aircraft skins, because the thermal expansion of boron is close to aluminum, and there is no galvanic corrosion potential. The boron fiber is difficult to use if the parent material surface has a contour shape. The boron fibers are very expensive and can be hazardous for personnel. Boron fibers are used primarily in military aviation applications. Ceramic fibers. Ceramic fibers are used for high temperature applications, such as turbine blades in a gas turbine engine. The ceramic fibers can be used to temperatures up to 2200 degrees F. Lightning protection fibers. An aluminum airplane is quite conductive and is able to dissipate the high currents resulting from a lightning strike. Carbon fibers are 1000 times more resistive than aluminum to current flow, and epoxy resin is 1 million times more resistive, i.e., perpendicular to the skin. The surface of an external composite component often consists of a plier layer of conductive material for lightning strike protection, because composite materials are less conductive than aluminum. Many different types of conductive materials are used ranging from nickel-coated graphite cloth to metal meshes to aluminized fiberglass to conductive paints. The materials are available for wet layup and as pre -preg. In addition to a normal structural repair, the technician must also recreate the electrical conductivity designed into the part. These types of repair generally require a conductivity test to be performed with an ohmmeter to verify minimum electrical resistance across the structure. When repairing these types of structures, it is extremely important to use only the approved materials from authorized vendors, including such items as potting compounds, sealants, adhesives, and so forth. Figures 7-8 and 7-9. Matrix materials. Thermosetting resins. Resin is a generic term used to designate the polymer. The resin, its chemical composition, and physical properties fundamentally affect the processing, fabrication, and figure 7-7. Fiberglass, left, of registered, middle, and carbon fiber material, right. Figure 7-8. Copper mesh lightning protection material. 7-6. Figure 7-9. Aluminum mesh lightning protection material. Ultimate properties of a composite material. Thermosetting resins are the most diverse and widely used of all man-made materials. 
They are easily poured or formed into any shape, are compatible with most other materials, and cure readily by heat or catalyst into an insoluble solid. Thermosetting resins are also excellent adhesives and bonding agents. Polyester resins. Polyester resins are relatively inexpensive, fast processing resins used generally for low cost applications. Low smoke producing polyester resins are used for interior parts of the aircraft. Fiber reinforced polyesters can be processed by many methods. Common processing methods include match metal molding, wet layup, press, vacuum bag, molding, injection molding, filament winding, protrusion, and autoclaving. Vinyl ester resin. The appearance, handling properties, and curing characteristics of vinyl ester resins are the same as those of conventional polyester resins. However, the corrosion resistance and mechanical properties of vinyl ester composites are much improved over standard polyester resin composites. Phenolic resin. Phenol formaldehyde resins were first produced commercially in the early 1900s for use in the commercial market. Erie formaldehyde and melamine formaldehyde appeared in the 1920-1930s as a less expensive alternative for lower temperature use. Phenolic resins are used for interior components because of their low smoke and flammability characteristics. Epoxy. Epoxies are polymerizable thermosetting resins and are available in a variety of viscosities from liquid to solid. There are many different types of epoxy, and the technician should use the maintenance manual to select the correct type for a specific repair. Epoxies are used widely in resins for pre-prep materials and structural adhesives. The advantages of epoxies are high strength and modulus, low levels of volatiles, excellent adhesion, low shrinkage, good chemical resistance, and ease of processing. Their major disadvantages are brittleness and the reduction of properties in the presence of moisture. The processing or curing of epoxies is slower than polyester resins. Processing techniques include autoclave molding, filament winding, press molding, vacuum bag molding, resin transfer molding, and protrusion. Curing temperatures vary from room temperature to approximately 350 degrees F, 180 degrees C. The most common cure temperatures range between 250 degrees and 350 degrees F, 120-180 degrees C. Figure 7-10. Polyimides. Polyamide resins excel in high temperature environments where their thermal resistance, oxidative stability, low coefficient of thermal expansion, and solvent resistance benefit the design. Their primary uses are circuit boards and hot engine and airframe structures. A polyamide may be either a thermoset resin or a thermoplastic. Polyamides require high cure temperatures, usually in excess of 550 degrees F, 290 degrees C. Consequently, normal epoxy composite bagging materials are not usable, and steel tooling becomes a necessity. Polyamide bagging and release films, such as Captain Registered, are used. It is extremely important that Upilex Registered replace the lower cost nylon bagging and polytetrafluorothylene PTFE, release films common to epoxy composite processing. Fiberglass fabrics must be used for bleeder and breeder materials. Figure 7 10. Two part wet layup epoxy resin system with pump dispenser. 7 7. Instead of polyester matte materials due to the low melting point of polyester, polybenzamidazoles, PPI. Polybenzamidazole resin is extremely high temperature resistant and is used for high temperature materials. These resins are available as adhesive and fiber. Bismolamides, BMI. Bismolamide resins have a higher temperature capability and higher toughness than epoxy resins, and they provide excellent performance at ambient and elevated temperatures. The processing of bismolamide resins is similar to that for epoxy resins. BMIs are used for aero engines and high temperature components. BMIs are suitable for standard autoclave processing, injection molding, resin transfer molding, and sheet molded compound, SMC, among others. Thermoplastic resins. Thermoplastic materials can be softened repeatedly by an increase of temperature and hardened by a decrease in temperature. Processing speed is the primary advantage of thermoplastic materials. Chemical curing of the material does not take place during processing, and the material can be shaped by molding or extrusion when it is soft. Semi-crystalline thermoplastics. Semi-crystalline thermoplastics possess properties of inherent flame resistance, superior toughness, good mechanical properties at elevated temperatures and after impact, and low moisture absorption. They are used in secondary and primary aircraft structures. Combined with reinforcing fibers, they are available in injection molding compounds, compression multiple random sheets, unidirectional tapes, prepregs fabricated from tow, topric, and woven prepregs. Fibers impregnated in semi-crystalline thermoplastics include carbon, nickel-coated carbon, aramid, glass, quartz, and others. Amorphous thermoplastics. Amorphous thermoplastics are available in several physical forms, including films, filaments, and powders. Combined with reinforcing fibers, they are also available in injection molding compounds, compressive multiple random sheets, unidirectional tapes, woven prepregs, etc. The fibers used are primarily carbon, aramid, and glass. The specific advantages of amorphous thermoplastics depend upon the polymer. Typically, the resins are noted for their processing ease and speed, high temperature capability, good mechanical properties, excellent toughness and impact strength, and chemical stability. 
The stability results in unlimited shelf life, eliminating the cold storage requirements of thermoset free bags. Polyether Ether Ketten, Peak. Polyether Ether Ketten, better known as Peak, is a high temperature thermoplastic. This aromatic ketten material offers outstanding thermal and combustion characteristics and resistance to a wide range of solvents and proprietary fluids. Peak can also be reinforced with glass and carbon. Curing stages of resins. Thermosetting resins use a chemical reaction to cure. There are three curing stages, which are called A, B, and C. A stage. The components of the resin, base material and hardener, have been mixed, but the chemical reaction does not start it. The resin is in the A stage during a wet layup procedure. B stage. The components of the resin, have been mixed, and the chemical reaction has started. The material has thickened and is tacky. The resins of prepreg materials are in the B stage. To prevent further curing the resin is placed in the freezer at 0 degrees F. In the frozen state, the resin of the prepreg material stays in the B stage. The curing starts when the material is removed from the freezer and warmed again. C stage. The resin is fully cured. Some resins cure at room temperature and others need an elevated temperature cure cycle to fully cure. Pre-impregnated products, prepregs. Prepreg material consists of a combination of a matrix and fiber reinforcement. It is available in unidirectional form, one direction of reinforcement, and fabric form, several directions of reinforcement. All five of the major families of matrix resins can be used to impregnate various fiber forms. The resin is then no longer in a low viscosity stage, but has been advanced to a B stage level of cure for better handling characteristics. The following products are available in prepreg form. Unidirectional tapes, woven fabrics, continuous strand rovings, and shop mat. Prepreg materials must be stored in the freezer at a temperature below 0 degrees F to retard the curing process. Prepreg materials are cured with an elevated temperature. Many prepreg materials used in aerospace are impregnated with an epoxy resin, and they are cured at either 250 degrees F or 350 degrees F. Prepreg materials are cured with an autoclave, oven, or heat blanket. They are typically purchased and stored on the roll in a sealed plastic bag to avoid moisture contamination. Figure 7-11. Dry fiber material. Dry fiber materials, such as carbon, glass, and Kevlar registered are used for many aircraft repair procedures. The dry fabric is impregnated with the resin just before the repair work starts. This process is often called wet layup. The main advantage of using the wet layup process is that the fiber and resin can. 7-8. Support support. Polyethylene protector. 1 to 1500 mm. Weft. 50 to 1500 mm. Silicone paper protector warp. Unidirectional reinforcement, tape, fabric reinforcement. Figure 7 11. Tape and fabric prepreg materials. Be stored for a long time at room temperature. The composite can be cured at room temperature, or an elevated temperature cure can be used to speed up the curing process and increase the strength. The disadvantage is that the process is messy, and reinforcement properties are less than prepreg material properties. Figure 7 12. Fixotropic agents. Fixotropic agents are gel like at rest, but become fluid when agitated. These materials have high static shear strength and low dynamic shear strength at the same time, to lose viscosity under stress. Adhesives. Film adhesives. Structural adhesives for aerospace applications are generally supplied as thin films supported on the release paper and stored under refrigerated conditions, 18 degrees C, or 0 degrees F. Film adhesives are available using high temperature aromatic. A minor catalytic curing agents with a wide range of flexibilizing and toughening agents. Rubber toughened epoxy film adhesives are widely used in aircraft industry. The upper temperature limit of 121-177 degrees C, 250-350 degrees F, is usually dictated by the degree of toughening required, and by the overall choice of resins and curing agents. In general, toughening of a resin results in a lower usable service temperature. Film materials are frequently supported by fibers, that serve to improve handling of the films prior to cure, control adhesive flow during bonding, and assist in bond line thickness control. Fibers can be incorporated as short fiber mats with random orientation, or as woven cloth. Commonly encountered fibers are polyesters, polyamides, nylon, and glass. Adhesives containing woven cloth may have slightly degraded environmental properties, because of wicking of water by the fiber. Random matte scrim cloth is not as efficient for controlling film thickness as woven cloth, because the unrestricted fibers move during bonding. Spunbonded non-woven scrims do not move and are, therefore, widely used. Figures 7-13 and 7-14. Paste adhesives. Paste adhesives are used as an alternative to film adhesive. These are often used to secondary bond repair patches to damaged parts, and also used in places where film adhesive is difficult to apply. Paste adhesives for structural bonding are made mostly from epoxy. One part and two part systems are available. The advantages of paste adhesives are that they can be stored at room temperature and have a long shelf life. The disadvantage is that the bond line thickness is hard to control, which affects the strength of the bond. A scrim cloth can be used to maintain adhesive in the bond line when bonding patches with paste adhesive. Figure 7-15. Figure 7-12. 
dry fabric materials, top to bottom. Aluminum lightning protection mess, of lair registered, fiberglass, and carbon fiber. 7-9. BMS 5-15405 film adhesive. Sanding ply 120 fiberglass. Carbon fabric 3K70 PW at plus or minus 45. BMS 5-154 GR05 film adhesive. Figure 7-13. The use of film adhesive mess, cavalier register, fiberglass, and carbon fiber. Figure 7-14. The roll of film adhesive. Figure 7-15. Two-part paste adhesive. Foaming adhesives. Most foaming adhesives are 0.025 inch to 0.10 inch thick sheets of D-staged epoxy. Foam adhesives cure at 250 degrees F, or 350 degrees F. During the cure cycle, the foaming adhesives expand. Foaming adhesives need to be stored in the freezer just like pre -pregs, and they have only a limited storage life. Foaming adhesives are used to splice pieces of honeycomb together in a sandwich construction, and to bond repair plugs to the existing core during a pre -preg repair. Figure 7-16. Description of sandwich structures. Theory A sandwich construction is a structural panel concept that consists in its simplest form of two relatively thin, parallel face sheets bonded to and separated by a relatively thick, lightweight core. The core supports the face sheets against buckling, and resists out of plane shear loads. The core must have high shear strength and compression stiffness. Composite sandwich construction is most often fabricated using autoclave cure, press cure, or vacuum back cure. Skin. 7-10. Core splicing. Solid material. Foaming adhesive. Core thickness T. Core thickness 3T. T2 T4 T. Thickness flexural strength weight. Table 2. 1.0. 1.0. 1.0. 7.0. 3.5. 1.03, 37.0, 9.2, 1.06, 7-18. Strength and stiffness of honeycomb sandwich material compared to a solid laminate. Use in a repair. Figure 7-16. The use of foaming adhesives. Laminates may be pre-cured, and subsequently bonded to core, co-cured to core in one operation, or a combination of the two methods. Examples of honeycomb structure are wing spoilers, fairings, ailerons, flaps, nacelles, floorboards, and rudders. Figure 7-17. Properties. Sandwich construction has high bending stiffness at minimal weight in comparison to aluminum and composite laminate construction. Most honeycombs are anisotropic, that is, properties are directional. Figure 7-18 illustrates the advantages of using a honeycomb construction. Increasing the core thickness greatly increases the stiffness of the honeycomb construction, while the weight increase is minimal. Due to the high stiffness of a honeycomb construction, it is not necessary to use external stiffeners, such as stringers and frames. Figure 7-18. Facing materials. Most honeycomb structures used in aircraft construction have aluminum, fiberglass, Kevlar registered, or carbon fiber face sheets. Carbon fiber face sheets cannot be used with aluminum honeycomb core material, because it causes the aluminum to corrode. Titanium and steel are used for specialty applications in high temperature constructions. The face sheets of many components, such as spoilers and flight controls, are very thin sometimes only 3 or 4 plies. Field reports have indicated that these face sheets do not have a good impact resistance. Core materials. Honeycomb. Each honeycomb material provides certain properties and has specific benefits. Figure 7-19 The most common core material used for aircraft honeycomb structures is aramid paper, Nomex registered or Corex registered. Fiberglass is used for higher strength applications. Craft paper relatively low strength, good insulating properties, is available in large quantities, and has a low cost. Adhesive film, optional. Repreg skin. Repreg skin. Honeycomb, or foam. Figure 7-17. Honeycomb sandwich construction. Figure 7-19. Honeycomb core materials. 7-11. Thermoplastics good insulating properties, good energy absorption and door redirection, smooth cell walls, moisture and chemical resistance, are environmentally compatible, aesthetically pleasing, and have a relatively low cost. Aluminum best strength to weight ratio and energy absorption, has good heat transfer properties, electromagnetic shielding properties, has smooth, thin cell walls, is machinable, and has a relatively low cost. Steel good heat transfer properties, electromagnetic shielding properties, and heat resistant. Specialty metals, titanium, relatively high strength to weight ratio, good heat transfer properties, chemical resistance, and heat resistant to very high temperatures. Aramid paper flame resistant, fire retardant, good insulating properties, low dielectric properties, and good formability. Fiberglass tailorable shear properties by layup, low dielectric properties, good insulating properties, and good formability. Carbon good dimensional stability and retention, high temperature property retention, high stiffness, very low coefficient of thermal expansion, tailorable thermal conductivity, relatively high shear modulus, and very expensive. 
Ceramics heat resistant to very high temperatures, good insulating properties, is available in very small cell sizes, and very expensive. Figure 7-19. Honeycomb core cells for aerospace applications are usually hexagonal. The cells are made by bonding stacked sheets at special locations. The stacked sheets are expanded to form hexagons. The direction parallel to the sheets is called driven direction. Bisected hexagonal core has another sheet of material cutting across each hexagon. Bisected hexagonal honeycomb is stiffer and stronger than hexagonal core. Overexpanded core is made by expanding the sheets more than is needed to make hexagons. The cells of overexpanded core are rectangular. Overexpanded core is flexible perpendicular to the ribbon direction and is used in panels with simple curves. Bell-shaped core, or flexicore, has curved cell walls that make it flexible in all directions. Bell-shaped core is used in panels with complex curves. Honeycomb core is available with different cell sizes. Small sizes provide better support for sandwich face sheets. Honeycomb is also available in different densities. Higher density core is stronger and stiffer than lower density core. Figure 7-20. Hexagonal honeycomb core. Flexicor. Overexpanded core. Figure 7-20. Honeycomb density. Foam. Foam cores are used on home builds and lighter aircraft to give strength and shape to wing tips, flight controls, fuselage sections, wings, and wing ribs. Foam cores are not commonly used on commercial type aircraft. Foams are typically heavier than honeycomb and not as strong. A variety of foams can be used as core material including polystyrene, better known as styrofoam, aircraft grade styrofoam with a tightly closed cell structure and no voids between cells, high compressive strength and good resistance to water penetration, can be cut with a hot wire to make airfoil shapes. 7-12. Phenolic very good fire resistant properties and can have very low density but relatively low mechanical properties. Polyurethane used for producing the fuselage, wing tips, and other curved parts of small aircraft, relatively inexpensive, fuel resistant, and compatible with most adhesives. Do not use a hot wire to cut polyurethane foam, easily contoured with a large knife and sanding equipment. Polypropylene used to make airfoil shapes, can be cut with a hot wire, compatible with most adhesives and epoxy resins, not for use with polyester resins, dissolves in fuels and solvents. Polyvinyl chloride, PVC, Divinacel, Legacel, and Erex, a closed cell medium to high density foam with high compression strength, durability, and excellent fire resistance, can be vacuum formed to compound shapes, and be bent using heat, compatible with polyester, vinyl ester, and epoxy resins. Polymethacrylamide, Robacel, a closed cell foam used for lightweight sandwich construction, excellent mechanical properties, high dimensional stability under heat, good solvent resistance, and outstanding creep compression resistance, more expensive than the other types of foams, but has greater mechanical properties. Pulsa wood. Pulsa is a natural wood product with elongated closed cells. It is available in a variety of grades that correlate to the structural, cosmetic, and physical characteristics. The density of pulsa is less than one half of the density of conventional wood products. However, Pulsa has a considerably higher density than the other types of structural cores. Manufacturing and in-service damage. Manufacturing defects. Manufacturing defects include Delimination resin starved areas resin rich areas blisters, air bubbles wrinkles voids thermal decomposition. Manufacturing damage includes anomalies, such as porosity, micro-cracking, and deliminations resulting from processing discrepancies. It also includes such items as inadvertent, edge cuts, surface gouges and scratches, damaged fastener holes, and impact damage. Examples of flaws occurring in manufacturing include a contaminated bond line surface or inclusions, such as pre-prec backing paper or separation film, that is inadvertently left between flies during layup. Inadvertent, non-process, damage can occur in detail parts or components during assembly or transport or during operation. A part is resin-rich, if too much resin is used. For non-structural applications this is not necessarily bad, but it adds weight. A part is called resin-starved, if too much resin is bled off during the curing process, or if not enough resin is applied during the wet layup process. Resin-starved areas are indicated by fibers that show to the surface. The ratio of 60-40 fiber to resin ratio is considered optimum. Sources of manufacturing defects include Improper cure processing Improper machining Mishandling Improper drilling Pool drops Contamination Improper sanding Substandard material Inadequate tooling Mislocation of holes or details Damage can occur at several scales within the composite material and structural configuration. This ranges from damage in the matrix and fiber to broken elements and failure of bonded or bolted attachments. The extent of damage controls repeated load life and residual strength and is critical to damage tolerance. Fiber breakage. Fiber breakage can be critical because structures are typically designed to be fiber dominant, i.e., fibers carry most of the loads. Fortunately, fiber failure is typically limited to a zone near the point of impact and is constrained by the impact object size and energy. 
only a few of the service-related events listed in the previous section, but lead to large areas of fiber damage. Matrix Imperfections Matrix imperfections usually occur on the matrix fiber interface, or in the matrix parallel to the fibers. These imperfections can slightly reduce some of the material properties, but are seldom critical to the structure, unless the matrix degradation is widespread. Accumulation of matrix. 7-13 Cracks can cause the degradation of matrix-dominated properties. For laminates designed to transmit loads with their fibers, fiber-dominant, only a slight reduction of properties is observed when the matrix is severely damaged. Matrix cracks, or micro-cracks, can significantly reduce properties dependent on the resin or the fiber-resin interface, such as interlaminar shear and compression strength. Micro-cracking can have a very negative effect on properties of high-temperature resins. Matrix imperfections may develop into deluminations, which are a more critical type of damage. Delumination and Debens Deluminations form on the interface between the layers in the laminate. Deluminations may form from matrix cracks that grow into the interlaminar layer or from low energy impact. Debens can also form from production non-adhesion along the bond line between two elements and initiate delumination in adjacent laminate layers. Under certain conditions, deluminations or debens can grow when subjected to repeated loading and can cause catastrophic failure when the laminate is loaded in compression. The criticality of deluminations or debens depends on dimensions, number of deluminations at a given location, location and the thickness of laminate, in the structure, proximity to free edges, stress concentration region, geometrical discontinuities, ec. Loads behavior of deluminations and debens depend on loading type. They have little effect on the response of laminates loaded in tension. Under compression or shear loading, however, the sublaminates adjacent to the deluminations or debented elements may buckle and cause a load redistribution mechanism that leads to structural failure. Combinations of damages. In general, impact events cause combinations of damages. High energy impacts by large objects, e.g., turbine blades, may lead to broken elements and failed attachments. The resulting damage may include significant fiber failure, matrix cracking, elimination, broken fasteners, and debented elements. Damage caused by low energy impact is more contained, but may also include a combination of broken fibers, matrix cracks, and multiple deliminations. Flawed fastener holes. Improper hole drilling, poor fastener installation, and missing fasteners may occur in manufacturing. Hole elongation can occur due to repeated load cycling in service. In-service defects. In-service defects include environmental degradation, impact damage, fatigue, cracks from local overload, debenting, delimination, fiber fracturing, erosion. Many honeycomb structures, such as wing spoilers, fairings, flight controls, and landing gear doors, have thin face sheets which have experienced durability problems that could be grouped into three categories. Low resistance to impact, liquid aggression, and erosion. These structures have adequate stiffness and strength, but low resistance to a service environment in which parts are crawled over, tools dropped, and service personnel are often unaware of the fragility of thin skin sandwich parts. Damages to these components, such as core crush, impact damages, and dismans, are quite often easy to detect with a visual inspection due to their thin face sheets. However, they are sometimes overlooked or damaged by service personnel who do not want to delay aircraft departure or bring attention to their accidents, which might reflect poorly on their performance record. Therefore, damages are sometimes allowed to go unchecked, often resulting in growth of the damage due to liquid aggression into the core. Non-durable design details, e.g., improper core edge closeouts, also lead to liquid aggression. The repair of parts due to liquid aggression can vary depending on the liquid, most commonly water or skydrol, hydraulic fluid. Water tends to create additional damage in repaired parts when cured, unless all moisture is removed from the part. Most repair material systems cure at temperatures above the boiling point of water, which can cause a dismant at the skin-to-core interface wherever trapped water resides. For this reason, core drying cycles are typically included prior to performing any repair. Some operators take the extra step of placing a damaged, but unrepaired part in the autoclave, to dry to preclude any additional damage from occurring during the cure of the repair. Skydrol presents a different problem. Once the core of a sandwich part is saturated, complete removal of Skydrol is almost impossible. The part continues to weep the liquid even in pure until bond lines can become contaminated and full bonding does not occur. Removal of contaminated core and adhesive as part of the repair is highly recommended. Figure 7-21 7-14 Figure 7-21 Damage to Ratome Honeycomb Sandwich Structure Erosion capabilities of composite materials have been known to be less than that of aluminum and, as a result, their application in leading edge surfaces has been generally avoided. However, composites have been used in areas of highly complex geometry, but generally with an erosion coating. The durability and maintainability of some erosion coatings are less than ideal. Another problem, not as obvious as the first, is that edges of doors or panels can erode if they are exposed to the air stream. This erosion can be attributed to improper design or installation slash fit-up. On the other hand, 
metal structures in contact or in the vicinity of these composite parts may show corrosion damage due to inappropriate choice of aluminum alloy. Damaged corrosion sealant of metal parts during assembly or at splices, or insufficient sealant and or lack of glass fabric isolation flies at the interfaces of spars, ribs, and fittings. Figure 7-22. Corrosion. Many fiberglass and Kevlar registered parts have a fine aluminum mesh for lightning protection. This aluminum mesh often corrodes around the bolt or screw holes. The corrosion affects the electrical bonding of the panel, and the aluminum mesh needs to be removed, and new mesh installed to restore the electrical bonding of the panel. Figure 7-23. Ultraviolet, UV, light affects the strength of composite materials. Composite structures need to be protected by a top coating to prevent the effects of UV light. Special UV primers and paints have been developed to protect composite materials. Non-destructive inspection, NDI, of composites. Visual inspection. A visual inspection is the primary inspection method for in-service inspections. Most types of damage scorch, stain, dent, penetrate, abrade, or chip the composite surface, making the damage visible. Once damage is detected, the affected area needs to be inspected closer using flashlights, magnifying glasses, mirrors, and borescopes. These tools are used to magnify defects that otherwise might not be seen easily, and to allow visual inspection of areas that are not readily accessible. Resin starvation, resin richness, wrinkles, fly bridging, discoloration, due to overheating, lightning strike, ek. Impact damage by any cause, foreign matter, blisters, and dismantling are some of the discrepancies that can be detected with a visual inspection. Visual inspection cannot find internal flaws in the composite, such as deluminations, dismants, and matrix crazing. More sophisticated NDI techniques are needed to detect these types of defects. Figure 7 22. Erosion damage to wingtip. 7 15. Figure 7 23. Erosion of aluminum lightning protection mesh. Audible sonic testing, coin tapping. Sometimes referred to as audio, sonic, or coin tap. This technique makes use of frequencies in the audible range 10Hz to 20Hz. A surprisingly accurate method in the hands of experienced personnel, tap testing is perhaps the most common technique used for the detection of delimination and or dismant. The method is accomplished by tapping the inspection area with a solid round disc or lightweight hammer-like device and listening to the response of the structure to the hammer. Figure 7-24 A clear, sharp, ringing sound is indicative of a well-bonded solid structure, while a dull or thud-like sound indicates a discrepant area. The tapping rate needs to be rapid enough to produce enough sound for any difference in sound tone to be discernible to the ear. Tap testing is effective on thin skin to stiffener bond lines, honeycomb sandwich with thin face sheets, or even near the surface of thick laminates, such as rotorcraft blade. Supports. Again, inherent in the method, is the possibility that changes within the internal elements of the structure might produce pitch changes that are interpreted as defects, when in fact they are present by design. This inspection should be accomplished in as quiet an area as possible, and by experienced personnel familiar with the part's internal configuration. This method is not reliable for structures with more than four plies. It is often used to map out the damage on thin honeycomb face sheets. Figure 7-24. Automated tap test. This test is very similar to the manual tap test, except that a solenoid is used instead of a hammer. The solenoid produces multiple impacts in a single area. The tip of the impactor has a transducer that records the force versus time signal of the impactor. The magnitude of the force depends on the impactor, the impact energy, and the mechanical properties of the structure. The impact duration, period, is not sensitive. Tap hammer. 2538mm, 1.00, 1.50 in, approximately. 38mm, 1.50 in, approximately. Panel surface. Figure 7-24. Tap test with tap hammer. 7-16 the magnitude of the impact force, however, this duration changes as the stiffness of the structure is altered. Therefore, the signal from an unflawed region is used for calibration, and any deviation from this unflawed signal indicates the existence of damage. Ultrasonic inspection. Ultrasonic inspection has proven to be a very useful tool for the detection of internal deluminations, voids, or inconsistencies in composite components not otherwise discernible using visual or tap methodology. There are many ultrasonic techniques, however, each technique uses sound wave energy with a frequency above the audible range. Figure 7-25 A high frequency, usually several MHZ, sound wave is introduced into the part, and may be directed to travel normal to the part surface, or along the surface of the part, or at some predefined angle to the part surface. You may need to try different directions to locate the flow. The introduced sound is then monitored as it travels its assigned route through the part for any significant change. Ultrasonic sound waves have properties similar to light waves. When an ultrasonic wave strikes an interrupting object, the wave or energy is either absorbed or reflected back to the surface. The disrupted or diminished sonic energy is then picked up by a receiving transducer and converted into a display on an oscilloscope or a chart recorder. The display allows the operator to evaluate the discrepant indications comparatively with those areas known to be good. 
To facilitate the comparison, reference standards are established and utilized to calibrate the ultrasonic equipment. The repair technician must realize that the concepts outlined here work fine in the repetitious manufacturing environment, but are likely to be more difficult to implement in a repair environment given the vast number of different composite components installed on the aircraft, and the relative complexity of their construction. The reference standards would also have to take into account the transmutations that take place when a composite component is exposed to an in-service environment over a prolonged period, or has been the subject of repair activity or similar restorative action. The four most common ultrasonic techniques are discussed next. Through transmission ultrasonic inspection. Through transmission ultrasonic inspection uses two transducers, one on each side of the area to be inspected. The ultrasonic signal is transmitted from one transducer to the other transducer. The loss of signal strength is then measured by the instrument. The instrument shows the loss as a percent of the original signal strength or the loss in decibels. The signal loss is compared to a reference standard. Areas with a greater loss than the reference standard indicate a defective area. 10. 9876. Signal strength. 543210. Pulse echo normal. 01234567810. Depth. Through transmission ultrasonic, TTU, handheld. Through transmission ultrasonic, TTU, water yoke. 10. Signal strength. 9876. 543210. Pulse echo delimination. 01234567810. Depth. Figure 7-25. Ultrasonic testing methods. 7-17 Pulse Echo Ultrasonic Inspection Single Side Ultrasonic Inspection may be accomplished using Pulse Echo techniques. In this method, a single search unit is working as a transmitting and a receiving transducer that is excited by high voltage pulses. Each electrical pulse activates the transducer element. This element converts the electrical energy into mechanical energy in the form of an ultrasonic sound wave. The sonic energy travels through a Teflon registered or methacrylate contact tip into the test part. A waveform is generated in the test part, and is picked up by the transducer element. Any change in amplitude of the received signal, or time required for the echo to return to the transducer, indicates the presence of a defect. Pulse echo inspections are used to find deluminations, cracks, porosity, water, and distance of bonded components. Pulse echo does not find distance or defects between laminated skins and honeycomb core. Figure 7-26. Ultrasonic bond tester inspection. Low frequency and high frequency bond testers are used for ultrasonic inspections of composite structures. These bond testers use an inspection probe that has one or two transducers. The high frequency bond tester is used to detect deluminations and voids. It cannot detect a skin toe honeycomb core dismant or porosity. It can detect defects as small as 0.5 inch in diameter. The low frequency bond tester uses two transducers and is used to detect deluminosion, voids, and skin to honeycomb core disbands. This inspection method does not detect which side of the part is damaged, and cannot detect defects smaller than 1.0 inch. Figure 7-27. Figure 7-27. On tester. Phased array inspection. Phased array inspection is one of the latest ultrasonic instruments to detect flaws in composite structures. It operates under the same principle of operation as Pulse Echo, but it uses 64 sensors at the same time, which speeds up the process. Figure 7-28. Radiography. Radiography, often referred to as X-ray, is a very useful NDI method, because it essentially allows a view into the interior of the part. This inspection method is accomplished by passing X-rays through the part or assembly being tested, while recording the absorption of the rays onto a film sensitive. Figure 7-26. Pulse Echo Test Equipment. 7-18. Figure 7-28. Phased Array Testing Equipment. The X-rays. The exposed film, when developed, allows the inspector to analyze variations in the opacity of the exposure recorded onto the film, in effect creating a visualization of the relationship of the component's internal details. Since the method records changes in total density through its thickness, it is not a preferred method for detecting defects such as deluminations that are in a plane that is normal to the ray direction. It is a most effective method, however, for detecting flaws parallel to the X-ray beam centerline. Internal anomalies, such as deluminations in the corners, crushed core, lone core, water and core cells, voids and foam adhesive joints, and relative position of internal details, can readily be seen via radiography. Most composites are nearly transparent to X-rays, so low energy rays must be used. Because of safety concerns, it is impractical to use around aircraft. Operators should always be protected by sufficient lead shields, as the possibility of exposure exists either from the X-ray tube, or from scattered radiation. Maintaining a minimum safe distance from the X-ray source is always essential. Thermography. Thermal inspection comprises all methods in which heat sensing devices are used to measure temperature variations for parts under inspection. The basic principle of thermal inspection consists of measuring or mapping of surface temperatures when heat flows from, to, or through a test object. All thermographic techniques rely on differentials in thermal conductivity between normal, defect-free areas, and those having a defect. 
Normally, a heat source is used to elevate the temperature of the part, being examined while observing the surface heating effects. Because defect-free areas conduct heat more efficiently than areas with defects, the amount of heat that is either absorbed or reflected indicates the quality of the bond. The type of defects that affect the thermal properties include debons, cracks, impact damage, panel thinning, and water increase into composite materials and honeycomb core. Thermal methods are most effective for thin laminates or for defects near the surface. Neutron radiography. Neutron radiography is a non-destructive imaging technique that is capable of visualizing the internal characteristics of a sample. The transmission of neutrons through a medium is dependent upon the neutron cross-sections for the nuclei in the medium. Differential attenuation of neutrons through a medium may be measured, mapped, and then visualized. The resulting image may then be utilized to analyze the internal characteristics of the sample. Neutron radiography is a complementary technique to X-ray radiography. Both techniques visualize the attenuation through a medium. The major advantage of neutron radiography is its ability to reveal light elements such as hydrogen found in corrosion products and water. Moisture detector. A moisture meter can be used to detect water and sandwich honeycomb structures. A moisture meter measures the radio frequency, RF, power loss caused by the presence of water. The moisture meter is often used to detect moisture in nose ratomes. Figure 7-29 Figure 7-30 provides a comparison of NDI testing equipment. Composite repairs. Layup materials. Hand tools. Reprec and dry fabrics can be cut with hand tools, such as scissors, pizza cutters, and knives. Materials made from Kevlar registered are more difficult to cut than fiberglass or carbon and tools wear quicker. A squeegee and a brush are used to impregnate dry fibers with resin for wet layup. Markers, rulers, and circle templates are used to make a repair layout. Figure 7-31. Air tools. Air-driven power tools, such as drill motors, routers, and grinders, are used for composite materials. Electric motors are not recommended, because carbon is a conductive material that can cause an electrical short circuit. If electric tools are used, they need to be of the totally enclosed type. Figure 7-32. Figure 7-29. Moisture tester equipment. 7-19. Type of defect. Method of inspection dismant elimination dent crack hole water ingestion. Overheat and burns. X. Lightning strike. X1 X1 X X. Visual XXXX X-ray ultrasonic TTU ultrasonic pulse echo ultrasonic on tester tap test infrared thermography dye penetrant eddy current chirography. XX2 X3 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 X1 X1 XXXX2 X3 XX1 X4 X4 Notes 1. For defects that open to the surface, 2. For thin structure, 3 plies or less, 3. The procedures for this type of inspection are being developed, 4. This procedure is not recommended. X. Figure 7-30. Comparison of NDI testing equipment. Figure 7-31. Hand tools for layup. Figure 7-32. Air tools used for composite repair. Call plate. A call plate made from aluminum is often used to support the part during the cure cycle. A mold release agent, or parting film, is applied to the call plate so that the part does not attach to the call plate. A thin call plate is also used on top of the repair when the heat counter is used. The call plate provides a more uniform heated area and it leaves a smoother finish of the composite laminate. Support tooling and molds. Certain repairs require tools to support the part and or maintain surface contour during cure. A variety of materials can be used to manufacture these tools. The type of material depends on the type of repair, cure temperature, and whether it is a temporary or permanent tool. Support tooling is necessary for oven and autoclave cure due to the high cure temperature. The parts. The form if support tooling is not used. There are many types of tooling material available. Some are molded to a specific part contour and others are used as rigid supports to maintain the contour during cure. Plaster is an inexpensive and easy material for contour tooling. It can be filled with fiberglass, hemp, or other material. Plaster is not very durable, but can be used for temporary tools. Often, a layer of fiberglass reinforced epoxy is placed on the tool side surface to improve the finished quality. Tooling resins are used to impregnate fiberglass, carbon fiber, or other reinforcements to make permanent tools. Complex parts are made from metal or high temperature tooling boards that are machined with 5-axis CNC equipment to make master tools that can be used to fabricate aircraft parts. Figure 7-33 and 7-34. 7-20. Figure 7-33. 5-axis CNC equipment for tool and mold making. Figure 7-34. A mold of an inlet duct. Vacuum bag materials. Repairs of composite aircraft components are often performed with a technique known as vacuum bagging. A plastic bag is sealed around the repair area. Air is then removed from the bag, which allows repair plies to be drawn together with no air trapped in between. Atmospheric pressure bears on the repair and a strong, secure bond is created. Several processing materials are used for vacuum bagging apart. These materials do not become part of the repair and are discarded after the repair process. 
release agents. Release agents, also called mold release agents, are used so that the part comes off the tool or call plate easily after curing. Bleeder ply. The bleeder ply creates a path for the air and volatiles to escape from the repair. Excess resin is collected in the bleeder. Bleeder material could be made of a layer of fiberglass, non-woven polyester, or it could be a perforated Teflon register coated material. The structural repair manual, SRM, indicates what type and how many plies of bleeder are required. As a general rule, the thicker the laminate, the more bleeder plies are required. Peel ply. Peel plies are often used to create a clean surface for ponding purposes. A thin layer of fiberglass is cured with the repair part. Just before the part is bonded to another structure, the peel ply is removed. The peel ply is easy to remove and leaves a clean surface for bonding. Peel plies are manufactured from polyester, nylon, fluorinated ethylene propylene, FEP, or coated fiberglass. They can be difficult to remove if overheated. Some coated peel plies can leave an undesirable contamination on the surface. The preferred peel ply material is polyester that has been heat set to eliminate shrinkage. Layup tapes. Vacuum back sealing tape, also called sticky tape, is used to seal the vacuum back to the part or tool. Always check the temperature rating of the tape before use to ensure that you use appropriately rated tape. Perforated release film. Perforated parting film is used to allow air and volatiles out of the repair, and it prevents the bleeder ply from sticking to the part or repair. It is available with different size holes and hole spacing depending on the amount of bleeding required. Solid release film. Solid release films are used so that the pre prep or wet lay of plies do not stick to the working surface or call plate. Solid release film is also used to prevent the resins from bleeding through and damaging the heat blanket or call plate if they are used. Breather material. The breather material is used to provide a path for air to get out of the vacuum bag. The breather must contact the bleeder. Typically, polyester is used in either 4 ounce or 10 ounce weights. 4 ounces is used for applications below 50 pounds per square inch, psi, and 10 ounces is used for 5100 psi. 7-21 Vacuum bag. The vacuum bag material provides a tough layer between the repair and the atmosphere. The vacuum bag material is available in different temperature ratings, so make sure that the material used for the repair can handle the cure temperature. Most vacuum bag materials are one-time use, but material made from flexible silicon rubber is reusable. Two small cuts are made in the bagging material so that the vacuum probe valve can be installed. The vacuum bag is not very flexible, and plies need to be made in the bag, if complex shapes are to be packed. Sometimes, an envelope-type bag is used, but the disadvantage of this method, is that the vacuum pressure might crush the part. Reusable bags made from silicon rubber are available, that are more flexible. Some have a built-in heater blanket that simplifies the bagging task. Figures 7-35, 7-36, and 7-37. Vacuum Equipment. A vacuum pump is used to evacuate air and volatiles from the vacuum bag, so that atmospheric pressure consolidates the plies. A dedicated vacuum pump is used in a repair shop. For repairs on the aircraft, a mobile vacuum pump could be used. Most heat monitors have a built-in vacuum pump. Special air hoses are used as vacuum lines, because regular air hoses might collapse when the vacuum is applied. The vacuum lines that are used in the oven or autoclave need to be able to withstand the high temperatures in the heating device. A vacuum pressure regulator is sometimes used to lower the vacuum pressure during the bagging process. Vacuum compaction table. A vacuum compaction table is a convenient tool for Debulkin composite layups with multiple plies. Essentially a reusable vacuum bag, a compaction table consists of a metal table surface with a hinged cover. The cover includes a solid frame, a flexible membrane, and a vacuum seal. Repair plies are laid up on the table surface and sealed beneath the cover with Figure 7-35 Bagging materials Figure 7-36 Bagging of complex part Figure 7-37 Self-sealing vacuum bag with heater element Vacuum to remove and trapped air Some compaction tables are heated, but most are not Heat sources Oven Composite materials can be cured in ovens using various pressure application methods Figure 7 38 Typically, vacuum bagging is used to remove volatiles and trapped air and utilizes atmospheric pressure for consolidation. Another method of pressure application for oven cures is the use of shrink wrapping or shrink tape. The oven uses heated air circulated at high speed to cure the material system. Typical oven cure temperatures are 250 degrees F and 350 degrees F. Ovens have a temperature sensor to feed temperature data back to the 7 22. Figure 7 38 Walk in curing oven. Oven controller. The oven temperature can differ from the actual part temperature depending upon the location of the oven sensor and the location of the part in the oven. The thermal mass of the part in the oven is generally greater than the surrounding oven, and during rise to temperature, the part temperature can lag the oven temperature by a considerable amount. To deal with these differences, at least two thermocouples must be placed on the part and connected to a temperature sensing device, separate charge recorder, hot monitor, ec, located outside the oven. Some oven controllers can be controlled by thermocouples placed on the repair part. Autoclave. 
An autoclave system allows a complex chemical reaction to occur inside a pressure vessel according to a specified time, temperature, and pressure profile in order to process a variety of materials. Figure 7-39 The evolution of materials and processes has taken autoclave operating conditions from 120 degrees C, 250 degrees F, and 275 Pa, 40 Psi, to well over 760 degrees C, 1400 degrees F, and 69,000 Pa, 10,000 Psi. Autoclaves that are operated at lower temperatures and pressures can be pressurized by air, but if higher temperatures and pressures are required for the cure cycle, a 50-50 mixture of air and nitrogen, or 100% nitrogen should be used to reduce the change of an autoclave fire. The major elements of an autoclave system are a vessel to contain pressure, sources to heat the gas stream and circulate it uniformly within the vessel, a subsystem to apply vacuum to parts covered by a vacuum bag, a subsystem to control operating parameters, and a subsystem to load the molds into the autoclave. Modern autoclaves are computer controlled and the operator can write and monitor all types of cure cycle programs. The most accurate way to control the cure cycle is to control the autoclave controller with thermocouples that are placed on the actual part. Most parts processed in autoclaves are covered with a vacuum bag that is used primarily for compaction of laminates and to provide a path for removal of volatiles. The bag allows the part to be subjected to differential pressure in the autoclave without being directly exposed to the autoclave atmosphere. The vacuum bag is also used to apply varying levels of vacuum to the part. Heat monitor and heat lamps. Typical on-aircraft heating methods include electrical resistance heat blankets, infrared heat lamps, and hot air devices. All heating devices must be controlled by some means so that the correct amount of heat can be applied. This is particularly important for repairs using prepreg material and adhesives, because controlled heating and cooling rates are usually prescribed. Figure 7-39. Autoclave. 7-23. Heat Hunter. A heat hunter is a portable device that automatically controls heating based on temperature feedback from the repair area. Heat hunters also have a vacuum pump that supplies and monitors the vacuum in the vacuum bag. The heat hunter controls the cure cycle with thermocouples that are placed near the repair. Some repairs require up to 10 thermocouples. Modern heat hunters can run many different types of cure programs and cure cycle data can be printed out or uploaded to a computer. Figure 7-40. Heat blanket. A heat blanket is a flexible heater. It is made of two layers of silicon rubber with a metal resistance heater between the two layers of silicon. Heat blankets are a common method of applying heat for repairs on the aircraft. Heat blankets may be controlled manually, however, they are usually used in conjunction with a heat hunter. Heat is transferred from the blanket via conduction. Consequently, the heat blanket must conform to and be in 100% contact with the part, which is usually accomplished using vacuum bag pressure. Figure 7-41. Heat lamp. Infrared heat lamps can also be used for elevated temperature curing of composites if a vacuum bag is not utilized. However, they are generally not effective for producing curing temperatures above 150 degrees F, or for areas larger than 2 square feet. It is also difficult to control the heat applied with a lamp, and lamps tend to generate high surface temperatures quickly. If controlled by thermostats, heat lamps can be useful in applying curing heat to larger irregular surfaces. Heat hunters can be used to control heat lamps. Hot air system. Hot air systems can be used to cure composite repairs, and are mainly restricted to small repairs and for drying the repair area. A heat generator supplies hot air that is directed into an insulated enclosure set up around the repair area after vacuum bagging has been deployed. The hot air surrounds the repair for even temperature rise. Heat press forming. During the press forming process, flat stack thermoplastic prepreg is heated to above melt temperature 340-430 degrees C or 645-805 degrees F in an oven, rapidly, 110 seconds, shuttled to a forming die, pressed to shape, and consolidated and cooled under pressure 707,000 Pa or 101,000 Psi. Figure 7-42 in production, press forming dies usually are matched male-female sets constructed of steel or aluminum. However, rubber, wood, phenolics, and so on can be used during prototyping. The die set can be maintained at room temperature throughout the forming consolidation cycle. But, the use of a hot die, 120-200 degrees C, or 250-390 degrees F, allows control of the cooling down rate, avoiding part warpage and controlling morphology in semi-crystalline thermoplastic prepreg, such as peak and polyphenylene sulfide, and extends the forming window promoting better ply slip. Figure 7-40. Heat hunter equipment. Figure 7-41. Heat blankets. Figure 7-42. Heat press. 7-24. The main disadvantage with this method is that the press only applies pressure in one direction, and hence, it is difficult to make complex shaped, e.g., beads, closed corners, parts or parts with legs that approach vertical. Since the temperature of the die set need not be cycled with each part, rapid forming times of between 10 minutes and 2 hours are achievable with press forming. Thermocouples. 
A thermocouple, TC, is a thermoelectric device used to accurately measure temperatures. It may be connected to a simple temperature reading device, or connected to a hot onder, oven, or other type of controller that regulates the amount of heat. TCs consist of a wire with two leads of dissimilar metals that are joined at one end. Heating the joint produces an electric current, which is converted to a temperature reading with a TC monitor. Select the type of wire, J or K, and the type of connector that are compatible with the local temperature monitoring equipment, hot onder, oven, autoclave, ECK. TC wire is available with different types of insulation. Check the manufacturer's product data sheets to ensure the insulation withstands the highest cure temperature. Teflon insulated wire is generally good for 390 degrees F and lower cures. Captain insulated wire should be used for higher temperatures. Thermocouple placement. Thermocouple placement is the key in obtaining proper cure temperatures throughout the repair. In general, the thermocouples used for temperature control should be placed as close as possible to the repair material without causing it to become embedded in the repair or producing indentations in the repair. They should also be placed in strategic hot or cold locations to ensure the materials are adequately cured, but not exposed to excessively high temperatures that could degrade the material's structural properties. The thermocouples should be placed as close as practical to the area that needs to be monitored. The following steps should be taken when using thermocouples. Never use fewer than three thermocouples to monitor a heating cycle. If mounting a pre-cured patch, place the thermocouple near the center of the patch. A control thermocouple may be centered over a low temperature, 200 degrees F or lower, co-cured patch, as long as it is placed on top of a thin metallic sheet to prevent a thermocouple indentation onto the patch. This may allow for a more accurate control of the patch temperature. The thermocouples installed around the perimeter of the repair patch should be placed approximately 0.5 inch away from the edge of the adhesive line. Place flash tape below and above the thermocouple tips to protect them from resin flash and to protect the control unit from electrical shorts. Do not place the thermocouple under the vacuum port as the pressure may damage the lead and cause erroneous readings to occur. Do not place thermocouple wires adjacent to or crossing the heat blanket power cord to prevent erroneous temperature readings caused by magnetic flux lines. Do not place any control thermocouple beyond the heat blanket's 2-inch overlap of the repair to prevent the controller from trying to compensate for the lower temperature. Always leave slack in the thermocouple wire under the vacuum bag to prevent the thermocouple from being pulled away from the area to be monitored as vacuum is applied. Thermal survey of repair area. In order to achieve maximum structural bonded composite repair, it is essential to cure these materials within the recommended temperature range. Failure to cure at the correct temperatures can produce weak patches and or bonding surfaces and can result in a repair failure during service. A thermal survey should be performed prior to installing the repair to ensure proper and uniform temperatures can be achieved. The thermal survey determines the heating and insulation requirements, as well as TC locations for the repair area. The thermal survey is especially useful for determining the methods of heating, hot air modules, heat lamps, heat blanket method and monitoring requirements in cases where heat sinks, substructure for instance, exist in the repair area. It should be performed for all types of heating methods to preclude insufficient, excessive, or uneven heating of the repair area. Temperature variations in repair zone. Thermal variations in the repair area occur for many reasons. Primary among these are material type, material thickness, and underlying structure in the repair zone. For these reasons, it is important to know the structural composition of the area to be repaired. Substructure existing in the repair zone conducts heat away from the repair area, resulting in a cold spot directly above the structure. Thin skins heat quickly and can easily be overheated. Thick skin sections absorb heat slowly and take longer to reach soak temperature. The thermal survey identifies these problem areas and allows the technician to develop the heat and insulation setup required for even heating of the repair area. 7-25 Thermal survey. During the thermal survey process, try to determine possible hot and cold areas in the repair zone. Temporarily attach a patch of the same material and thickness, several thermal couples, heating blanket, and a vacuum back to the repair area. Heat the area and, after the temperature is stabilized, record the thermocouple temperatures. Add insulation if the temperature of the thermocouple varies more than 10 degrees from average. The areas with a stringer and rip indicate a lower temperature than the middle of the patch, because they act as a heat sink. Add insulation to these areas to increase the temperature. Figure 7-43. Solutions to heat sink problems. Additional insulation can be placed over the repair area. This insulation can also be extended beyond the repair area to minimize heat being conducted away. Breather materials and fiberglass cloths work well, either on top of the vacuum bag, or within the vacuum bag, or on the accessible backside of the structure. Place more insulation over cool spots, and less insulation over hot spots. If access is available to the backside of the repair area, additional heat blankets could be placed there to heat the repair area more evenly. Types of layups. Wet layups. During the wet layup process, a dry fabric is impregnated with a resin. Mix the resin system, just before making the repair. Lay out the repair plies on the piece of fabric, and impregnate the fabric with the resin. 
After the fabric is impregnated, cut the repair plies, stack in the correct ply orientation, and vacuum back. Wet layup repairs are often used with fiberglass for non-structural applications. Carbon and Kevlar registered dry fabric could also be used with a wet layup resin system. Many resin systems used with wet layup cure at room temperature are easy to accomplish, and the materials can be stored at room temperature for long period of times. The disadvantage of room temperature wet layup is that it does not restore the strength and durability of the original structure and parts that were cured at 250 degrees F or 350 degrees F during manufacturing. Some wet layup resins use an elevated temperature cure and of improved properties. In general, wet layup properties are less than properties of prepreg material. Epoxy resins may require refrigeration until they are used. This prevents the aging of the epoxy. The label on the container states the correct storage temperature for each component. The typical storage temperature is between 40 degrees F and 80 degrees F for most epoxy resins. Some resin systems require storage below 40 degrees F. 300 degrees F temperature dwell. Ponded stringer. 2 inch min. 240 degrees. Patch perimeter. 290 degrees. Constant with density heat blanket. 2 inch min. 250 degrees. 300 degrees. 260 degrees. Rib. 280 degrees. 200 degrees. 200 degrees. Insulate due to rib heat sink. Figure 7-43. Thermal survey example. 7-26. Repreg. Repreg is a fabric or tape that is impregnated with a resin during the manufacturing process. The resin system is already mixed and is in the B stage cure. Store the prepreg material in the freezer below 0 degrees F to prevent further curing of the resin. The material is typically placed on the roll, and the packing material is placed on one side of the material so that the prepreg does not stick together. The prepreg material is sticky and adheres to other plies easily during the stack up process. You must remove the prepreg from the freezer and let the material thaw, which might take 8 hours for a full roll. Store the prepreg materials in a sealed, moisture proof bag. Do not open these bags until the material is completely thawed, to prevent contamination of the material by moisture. After the material is thawed and removed from the backing material, cut it in repair plies, stack in the correct ply orientation, and vacuum back. Do not forget to remove the backing material when stacking the plies. Cure prepregs at an elevated cure cycle, the most common temperatures used are 250 degrees F and 350 degrees F. Autoclaves, curing ovens, and heat hunters can be used to cure the prepreg material. Consolidation is necessary if parts are made from several layers of prepreg, because large quantities of air can be trapped between each prepreg layer. Remove this trapped air by covering the prepreg with a perforated release film and a breather ply, and apply a vacuum back. Apply the vacuum for 10 to 15 minutes at room temperature. Typically, attach the first consolidated ply to the tool face and repeat this process after every 3 or 5 layers depending on the prepreg thickness and component shape. Store prepreg, film adhesive, and foaming adhesives in the freezer at a temperature below 0 degrees F. If these types of materials need to be shipped, place them in special containers filled with dry ice. The freezer must not be of the automatic defrost type. The auto defrost cycle periodically warms the inside of the freezer, which can reduce the shelf life and consume the allowable out time of the composite material. Freezers must be capable of maintaining 0 degrees F or below. Most household freezers meet this level. Walk-in freezers can be used for large volume cold storage. If usage is small, a chest type freezer may suffice. Refrigerators are used to store laminating and paste adhesives and should be kept near 40 degrees F. Figure 7-44. Uncured prepreg materials have time limits for storage and use. Figure 7-45 The maximum time allowed for storing of a prepreg at low temperature is called the storage life, which is typically 6 months to a year. The material can be tested, and the storage life could be extended by the material manufacturer. The maximum time allowed for material at. Figure 7-44 Walk-in freezer for storing prepreg materials. Mechanical life. Recommended storage life handling life. Shipment date removed from refrigeration. Complete layup. Begin cure. Figure 7-45. Storage life for prepreg materials. Room temperature before the material cures is called the mechanical life. The recommended time at room temperature to complete layup and compaction is called the handling life. The handling life is shorter than the mechanical life. The mechanical life is measured from the time the material is removed from the freezer until the time the material is returned to the freezer. The operator must keep records of the time in and out of the freezer. Material that exceeds the mechanical life needs to be discarded. Many repair facilities cut the material in smaller kits and store them in moisture-proof bags that thaw quicker when removed from the freezer. This also limits the time out of the freezer for a big roll. All frozen prepreg materials need to be stored in moisture-proof bag to avoid moisture contamination. All prepreg materials should be protected from dust, oil, vapors, smoke, and other contaminants. A clean room for repair layup would be best, but if a clean room is not available, the prepreg should be protected by storing them in bags or keeping them covered with plastic. Before starting the layup, 
Cover the unprotected sides of the pre-pred with parting film, and clean the area being repaired immediately before laying up the repair plies. 7-27 pre material is temperature sensitive. Excessively high temperatures cause the material to begin curing, and excessively low temperatures make the material difficult to handle. For repairs on aircraft in very cold or very hot climates, the area should be protected by a tent around the repair area. Repair the pre-pred repair plies in a controlled temperature environment, and bring them to the repair area immediately before using them. Co-curing. Co-curing is a process wherein two parts are simultaneously cured. The interface between the two parts may or may not have an adhesive layer. Co-curing often results in poor panel surface quality, which is prevented by using a secondary surfacing material co-cured in the standard cure cycle, or a subsequent fill and fair operation. Co-cured skins may also have poor mechanical properties, requiring the use of reduced design values. A typical co-cure application is the simultaneous cure of a stiffener and a skin. Adhesive film is frequently placed into the interface between the stiffener and the skin to increase fatigue and peel resistance. Principal advantages derived from the co-cure process are excellent fit between bonded components and guaranteed surface cleanliness. Secondary bonding. Secondary bonding utilizes pre-cured composite detail parts, and uses a layer of adhesive to bond two pre-cured composite parts. Honeycomb sandwich assemblies commonly use a secondary bonding process to ensure optimal structural performance. Laminates co-cured over honeycomb core may have distorted plies that have dipped into the core cells. As a result, compressive stiffness and strength can be reduced as much as 10 and 20 percent, respectively. Pre-cured laminates undergoing secondary bonding usually have a thin nylon or fiberglass peel ply cured onto the bonding surfaces. While the peel ply sometimes hampers non-destructive inspection of the pre-cured laminate, it has been found to be the most effective means of ensuring surface cleanliness prior to bonding. When the peel ply is stripped away, a pristine surface becomes available. Light scuffed sanding removes high resin peak impressions produced by the peel ply weave which, if they fracture, create cracks in the bond line. Composite materials can be used to structurally repair, restore, or enhance aluminum, steel, and titanium components. Bonded composite doublers have the ability to slow or stop fatigue crack growth, replace lost structural area due to corrosion grindouts, and structurally enhance areas with small and negative margins. This technology has often been referred to as a combination of metal bonding and conventional on-aircraft composite bonded repair. Boron pre-break tape with an epoxy resin is most often used for this application. Co-bonding. In the co-bonding process, one of the detail parts is pre-cured with the mating part being cured simultaneously with the adhesive. Film adhesive is often used to improve peel strength. Layup process, typical laminated wet layup. Layup techniques. Read the SRM and determine the correct repair material, number of plies required for the repair, and the ply orientation. Dry the part, remove the damage, and taper sand the edges of damaged area. Use a piece of thin plastic, and trace the size of each repair ply from the damaged area. Indicate the ply orientation of each ply on the trace sheet. Copy the repair ply information to a piece of repair material that is large enough to cut all plies. Impregnate the repair material with resin, place a piece of transparent release film over the fabric, cut out the plies, and lay up the plies in the damaged area. The plies are usually placed using the smallest ply first taper layup sequence, but an alternative method is to use the largest ply first layup sequence. In this sequence, the first layer of reinforcing fabric completely covers the work area, followed by successively smaller layers, and then is finished with an extra outer layer or two extending over the patch and onto the sound laminate for some distance. Both methods are illustrated in figures 7-46 and 7-47. Ply locating template. Paper sanded repair. Part 0 direction. FP. E2. 45. E1. 0. E3. 0. E extra 0. Repair plies. Warp. Figure 7-46. Repair layup process. 7-28. Figure 7-47. Different layup techniques. Figure 7-48. Vacuum bagging of contoured part. Bleed-out technique. The traditional bleed-out using a vacuum bag technique places a perforated release film and a breather slash bleeder ply on top of the repair. The holes in the release film allow air to breath and resin to bleed off over the entire repair area. The amount of resin bled off depends on the size and number of holes in the perforated release film, the thickness of the bleeder slash breather cloth, the resin viscosity and temperature, and the vacuum pressure. Controlled bleed allows a limited amount of resin to bleed out in a bleeder ply. Place a piece of perforated release film on top of the pre pred material, a bleeder ply on top of the perforated release film, and a solid release film on top of the bleeder. Use a breather and a vacuum bag to compact the repair. The breather allows the air to escape. The bleeder can only absorb a limited amount of resin, and the amount of resin that is bled can be controlled by using multiple bleeder plies. Too many bleeder plies can result in a resin starved repair. Always consult the maintenance manual or manufacturer tech sheets for correct bagging and bleeding techniques. No bleed out. Repreg systems with 32 to 35% resin content are typically no bleed systems. 
These three pricks contain exactly the amount of resin needed in the cure to laminate. Therefore, resin lead off is not desired. Lead out of these three pricks results in the resin starved repair part. Many high strength three pricks in use today are no bleed systems. No bleeder is used, and the resin is trapped slash sealed so that none bleeds away. Consult the maintenance manual to determine if bleeder plies are required for the repair. A sheet of solid release film, no holes, is placed on top of the pre preg and taped off at the edges with flash tape. Small openings are created at the edges of the tape so that air can escape. A breather and vacuum bag are installed to compact the pre preg plies. The air can escape on the edge of the repair, but no resin can bleed out. Figure 7-48. Horizontal, or edge, bleed out is used for small room temperature wet layup repairs. A 2-inch strip of breather cloth is placed around the repair part, edge breather. There is no need for a release film, because there is no bleeder slash breather cloth on top of the repair. The part is impregnated with resin, and the vacuum bag is placed over the repair. A vacuum is applied, and a squeegee is used to remove air and excess resin to the edge breather. Fly orientation warp clock. In order to minimize any residual thermal stresses caused during cure of the resin, it is always good practice to design a symmetrical, or balanced, laminate. Examples of balanced laminates are presented in figure 7-49. The first example uses unidirectional tape, and examples 2 and 3 are typical quasi-isotropic laminates fabricated from woven cloth. Figure 7-50 presents examples of the effects caused by non-symmetrical laminates. These effects are most pronounced in laminates that are cured at high temperature in an autoclave or oven due to the thermal stresses developed in the laminate as the laminate cools down from the cure temperature to room temperature. Laminates cured at room temperature using typical wet layup do not exhibit the same degree of distortion due to the much smaller thermal stresses. Example amino written as 1. Plus or minus 45 degrees, 45 degrees, 0 degrees, 0 degrees, 45 degrees, plus 45 degrees, plus 45, 45, 0, S. 2. Plus or minus 45 degrees, 0 degrees slash 90 degrees, plus or minus 45 degrees, 0 degrees slash 90 degrees, 0 degrees slash 90 degrees, plus or minus 45 degrees, 0 degrees slash 90 degrees, plus or minus 45 degrees, plus or minus 45, 0 slash 90 right parenthesis 2s, 3. Plus or minus 45 degrees, plus or minus 45 degrees, 0 degrees slash 90 degrees, 0 degrees slash 90 degrees, plus or minus 45 degrees, plus or minus 45 degrees. Plus or minus 45 to 0 slash 90 s. Figure 7 dash 49. Examples of balanced laminates. Type example comments. Symmetrical, balanced. Non-symmetrical, balanced. Plus 45, 45, 0, 0, 45, plus 45. 90, plus 45, 0, 90, 45, 0. Flat, constant mid-plane stress. 7 dash 29. Induces curvature. 3 plus or minus 45 degrees, plus or minus 45 degrees, 0 degrees slash 90 degrees, 0 degrees slash 90 degrees, plus or minus 45 degrees, plus or minus 45 degrees, plus or minus 45 to 0 slash 90 s. Type example comments. Symmetrical, balanced. Plus 45, 45, 0, 0, 45, plus 45. Flat, constant mid-plane stress. Non-symmetrical, balanced. 90, plus 45, 0, 90, 45, 0, induces curvature, symmetrical, non-balanced, 45, 0, 0, 45, induces twist, non-symmetrical, non-balanced, 90, 45, 0, 90, 45, 0, induces twist and curvature, figure 7-50, examples of the effects caused by non-symmetrical laminates, the strength and stiffness of a composite buildup depends on the ply orientation, the practical range of strength and stiffness of carbon epoxy extends from values as low as those provided by fiberglass to as high as those provided by titanium. This range of values is determined by the orientation of the plies to the applied load. Because the strength design requirement is a function of the applied load direction, ply orientation and ply sequence must be correct. It is critical during the repair operation to replace each damaged ply with a ply of the same material and orientation or an approved substitute. Warp is the longitudinal fibers of a fabric. The warp is the high strength direction due to the straightness of the fibers. A warp clock is used to describe direction of fibers on the diagram, spec sheet, or manufacturer's sheets. If the warp clock is not available on the fabric, the orientation is defaulted to zero as the fabric comes off the roll. Therefore, 90 degrees to zero is across the width of the fabric. 90 degrees to zero is also called the fill direction. Mixing resins. Epoxy resins, like all multi-part materials, must be thoroughly mixed. Some resin systems have a dye added to aid in seeing how well the material is mixed. Since many resin systems do not have a dye, the resin must be mixed slowly and fully for 3 minutes. Air enters into the mixture if the resin is mixed too fast. If the resin system is not fully mixed, the resin may not cure properly. Make sure to scrape the edges and bottom of the mixing cup to ensure that all resin is mixed correctly. 
do not mix large quantities of quick curing resin. These types of resins produce heat after they are mixed. Smoke can burn or poison you when the resin overheats. Mix only the amount of material that is required. Mix more than one batch if more material is needed than the maximum batch size. Saturation techniques. For wet layup repair, impregnate the fabric with resin. It is important to put the right amount of resin on the fabric. Too much or too little resin affects the strength of the repair. Air that is put into the resin or not removed from the fabric also reduces the repair strength. Fabric impregnation with a pressure squeegee. The traditional way of impregnating the fabric is by using a pressure squeegee. The technician puts a mold release compound or a release film on the call plate so that the plies will not adhere to the call plate. Place a sheet of fabric on the call plate and apply resin in the middle of the sheet. Use a pressure squeegee to thoroughly wet the fabric. More plies of fabric and resin are added and the process is repeated until all plies are impregnated. A vacuum bag will be used to consolidate the plies and to bleed off excess resin and volatiles. Most wet layup processes have a room temperature cure but extra heat, up to 150 degrees F, are used to speed up the curing process. Figure 7-51. Fabric impregnation using a vacuum bag. The vacuum assisted impregnation method is used to impregnate repair fabric with a two-part resin while enclosed inside a vacuum bag. This method is preferred for tight knit weaves and when near optimum resin to fiber ratio is required. Compared to squeegee impregnation, this process reduces the level of entrapped air within the fabric and offers a more controlled and contained configuration for completing the impregnation process. Vacuum assisted impregnation consists of the following steps. 1. Place vacuum bag sealing tape on the table surface around the area that is used to impregnate the material. The area should be at least 4 inches larger than the material to be impregnated. 2. Place an edge breather cloth next to the vacuum bag sealing tape. The edge breather should be 1-2 inches wide. 3. Place a piece of solid parting film on the table. The sheet should be 2 inches larger than the material to be impregnated. 4. Weigh the fabric to find the amount of resin mix that is necessary to impregnate the material. 5. Lay the fabric on the parting film. 6. Put a piece of breather material between the fabric and the edge breather to provide an air path. 7-30. Figure 7-51. Fabric impregnation with a pressure squeegee. A. Wet layup materials. B. Fabric placement. C. Fabric impregnation. D. Squeegee used to thoroughly wet the fabric. 7. Pour the resin onto the fabric. The resin should be a continuous pool in the center area of the fabric. 8. Put vacuum probes on the edge breather. 9. Place a second piece of solid parting film over the fabric. This film should be the same size or larger than the first piece. 10. Place and seal the vacuum back and apply vacuum to the back. 11. Allow 2 minutes for the air to be removed from the fabric. 12. Sweep the resin into the fabric with a squeegee. Slowly sweep the resin from the center to the edge of the fabric. The resin should be uniformly distributed over all of the fabric. 13. Remove the fabric and cut the repair plies. Vacuum bagging techniques. Vacuum bag molding is a process in which the layup is cured under pressure generated by drawing a vacuum in the space. Between the layup and a flexible sheet placed over it and sealed at the edges. In the vacuum bag molding process, the plies are generally placed in the mold by hand layup using pre-prep or wet layup. High flow resins are preferred for vacuum bag molding. Single side vacuum bagging. This is the preferred method if the repair part is large enough for a vacuum bag on one side of the repair. The vacuum bag is taped in place with tacky tape and a vacuum port is placed through the bag to create the vacuum. Envelope bagging. Envelope bagging is a process in which the part to be repaired is completely enclosed in a vacuum bag or the bag is wrapped around the end of the component to obtain an adequate seal. It is frequently used for removable aircraft parts, such as flight controls, access panels, head, and when the part's geometry and or the repair location makes it very difficult to properly vacuum back and seal the area in a vacuum. In some cases, a part may be too small to allow installation of a single side. 7-31 Back Vacuum other times, the repair is located on the end of a large component that must have a vacuum bag wrapped around the ends and sealed all the way around. Figure 7-52. Alternate pressure application. 